Hello and welcome to our conversation with Dr. Melissa Farley on fracking and trafficking, making the connection. I'm Jenny LaMorgan, owner of GreenWomanStore.com, where we partner with women entrepreneurs, writers, and artists and share these free podcasts on issues important to us as women. Our guest, Dr. Melissa Farley, has been a practicing clinical psychologist for 45 years. She is a feminist, anti-pornography, and anti-prostitution researcher and activist. She is a member of Psychologists for Social Responsibility, and over 20 years ago in 1995, Dr. Farley founded the 501c3 nonprofit organization PRE, Prostitution Research and Education. PRE conducts research on prostitution, pornography, and trafficking, and offers education and consultation to researchers, survivors, the public, and policymakers. PRE's goal is to abolish the institution of prostitution, while at the same time, advocating for alternatives to trafficking and prostitution, including emotional and physical health care for women in prostitution. The free website, prostitutionresearch.com, includes a survivor's blog, news about prostitution research and anti-trafficking policy, and a list of agencies offering services to women who are escaping from or who have been in prostitution. Pre's research has been used by governments in South Africa, Canada, New Zealand, Ghana, Spain, Sweden, Korea, the United Kingdom, and the United States for education and policy development on prostitution and trafficking. Welcome, Melissa Farley, and thank you for sharing your important work nationally and globally with us here today. Thank you so much, Jenny, for inviting me to talk with you all at the Green Woman Store. (laughs) We are so glad to have you. You are in the hot spot um, of the universe right now with everything that's going on around climate change and uh, refugees and and, and fracking. I'm always amazed at how much fracking is going on around the world, so... Let's begin with a little background on PRE and why you felt it was necessary to start an organization to research and educate around prostitution 20 years ago. You know, we started the organization out of a conversation that I had with a prostituted woman who was being kicked off a San Francisco task force on prostitution. If you can believe that, she had some things to say about her experiences in prostitution that this pro-sex trade, pro-decriminalized pimp group of politicians and sex trade advocates, um, they didn't want to hear what she had to say. And so there was a move to get her back on this task force. Well, to make a long story short, she didn't get back on the task force. Uh, The task force didn't accept anything I contributed from other things I had read from groups like Whisper, Women Hurt in Systems of Prostitution Engaged in Revolt. They were active at the time. But this task force didn't want that. They wanted to mainstream the sex trade in the Bay Area. And so Norma Hotelling and I put our heads together. We got mad, and uh, that's how it all started. Her organization, SAGE, and the organization I started, Prostitution Research and Education, One of the functions of both of these groups was to counteract the lies and distortion and myths that are put out about prostitution being a nice job for poor women or a job where you get rich or a way of uh, 
pleasantly surviving college by making thousands of dollars, all of those, and, and certainly an institution where you never get hurt is also the idea. So that's, that's why we started this organization is to come up with real information, uh, from survivors of prostitution whose voices were not silenced to learn from them. And in the last 20, 25 years, I've, I've had the really amazing experience of meeting up with some of some people who become family to me from all over the world and, you know, 10, 11 countries on five continents that have contributed and worked with us in producing, at this point, 33 peer-reviewed articles that are in the professional literature about prostitution. That's a you long know, answer to that question. Sorry. No, that's it, – it's – it really reflects, I mean, I've seen maps of the world with red spots <clears throat> everywhere that there's fracking. And what you're describing is the same kind of a map to designate prostitution all over the world. You know, it's a global issue. And I don't know how we can begin to understand the connection between fracking and trafficking when we look at those maps, um, they're just they're well, all over the United States. Yes. I mean, certainly historically and today, uh, resource extraction from everybody else's home territory, that kind of colonial policy of assuming – that mostly countries led by white men have the right to go to other people's homelands, other people's nations, and take whatever they want. Um, it's been going on for many, many, many years, and it is still going on. I mean, where I come from this uh, connectedness perspective, uh, I mean, you and I both have a spiritual understanding as everything on the planet being connected. And I think a lot of people have that perspective. And politically, you know, Robin Morgan said many years ago, compartmentalization or disconnection is the primary tool of patriarchy and you can really see this when it comes to resource extraction and when it comes to the exploitation and abuse and sale of women in the sex trade. I mean, today, it seems like absolutely everything is for sale, Jenny, everything, mm -hmm. you know, and animals, trees, the parts of the ocean, and certainly women and children, Every, everything's for sale. And, um, we, you know, what I'm trying to point out to people are the connections between exploitation of the earth and exploitation of women. And I have certainly learned a huge amount from the articulation of that connection from First Nations people, for example, Lisa Bruner, who's Ojibwe from the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, explained, and I'm quoting her here because it's such a power, they're such powerful words. She said, they treat Mother Earth like they treat women. They think they can own us, buy us, sell us, trade us, rent us poison us, rape us, destroy us, use us as entertainment, and kill us. She also said, I'm happy to see that we're talking about the level of violence that's occurring against Mother Earth because it equates to us. 
what happens to her happens to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty much how I see it. And, um, you know, on a academic, uh, coming from an academic perspective, uh, there was an anthropologist in, I mean, Lisa Bruner said that recently, within the last year, year and a half. But in the 80s, this anthropologist, uh, who's famous for her work, uh, her name is Peggy Reeves Sanday. She described the, those same connections between how the earth is exploited and how women are exploited by studying 156 cultures. And what she saw when she categorized the culture are, as either rape free or rape prone, Sanday found a relationship between how the land was treated and how the women were treated in cultures where sexual violence was minimal or non-existent, the earth was relatively free of exploitation and destruction and resource extraction. And where there was environmental degradation, Sanday also saw high levels of sexual violence against women. Mm -hmm. So these are two different perspectives on the same thing that I I also see happening and and many many others do too. I think you know the work of Naomi Klein is really really important here and she's mm-hmm. she's getting that connection as well. Mhm. So how is this exploitation rationalized at fracking sites around the world and here in the United States? Well, I mean, people decide what a sacrifice zone is. First of all, they desig- they actually designate something as a sacrifice zone where the earth is basically going to be trashed. You, you're clear cutting old growth forests. You're, you're cutting off the top of a mountain. You're mining cobalt and coltan in Ituri people's lands in the Congo, which just just like um, like the kind of gold mining that happened in parts of California, it, it wrecks rivers and kills fish and leaves the land pretty devastated uh, indefinitely. So people decide that the products they're going to extract from the earth is worth more than uh, the land itself. And then in the process of doing that, they, they're they exploiting, first of all, largely male laborers, poor. I mean, and this is going on, for example, up in uh, Montana, in the Bakken oil fields where there's a mm-hmm. uh, huge uh, resource extraction of oil under punishing circumstances for the humans involved, which is poor working class or working class men who've never made this kind of money in their life coming up there living in these, quote, man camps. They're actually called mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. They're like tra- yeah. row after row after row of trailers. And these guys are working in, you know, 20, 30 below weather for for uh, 10, 15 hours a day. And in order to pacify them, as has been the case with blood diamonds in South Africa, Colton in the Congo, and every place else, women are shipped in for sale to these men who've got this uh, supply of cash that they're making. And they're away from their families, by the way. Mm -hmm. So you see prostitution springing up wherever there's a huge uh, resource extraction operation going on. And um, then sometimes either the oil runs out or the land is completely destroyed 
Or in the case of the Congo, you have environmentalists protesting against this mining because it's so toxic to everybody involved. And so the the mining shut down for whatever reason when the resource extraction stops, the prostitution does not. Once that once that industry is set up, and often we're talking uh sexist cultures where women can't make the kind of money that they make in prostitution any other way. So the prostitution stays, and that institution is introduced into a new community. Mm. So that's that's one thing that happens. And then, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, answer that question about how is it denied. I mean, it's it's kind of, I guess, uh, we're we're terribly used to lying these days, aren't we? With this president we have, I mean, lying is what Exxon did to tell us that there were no problems with uh, oil production any place, and that pipes didn't leak, and they didn't cause environmental disasters. Big tobacco mm-hmm. companies lied to us that tobacco did not cause cardiac and lung damage and lead to early death. Um, And the same thing happens with prostitution. Um, The pimps and the sex trade entrepreneurs that run gentlemen's clubs, strip clubs, escort agencies, uh, massage parlors, and brothels, um, all of these folks put out the message that prostitution doesn't hurt women, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's 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 the same thing as the tobacco and the oil companies. From my perspective, it's lying about it um, because these things are tremendously damaged, damaging to humans and certainly also in the case of uh, oil and other resource extraction. And massive plantations growing tobacco, of course, is is damaging to the land, just the way massive plantations in Northern California growing grapes is very harmful to uh, the indigenous plants and insects and small animals that once lived there. So you have the the denial of prostitution harm, and mm-hmm. now you have the denial of climate change, and, uh-huh. so you, and, and all of the other denials of, and like you said, lies that are out there. Um, and so this, it kind of creates a, a, it's 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 like the the earthquakes. I I am I am just amazed at the number of earthquakes in Oklahoma. And I we live you and I live in California and we have earthquakes, but we don't have daily yeah. earthquakes that shake our homes and damage our homes. And these are described as natural events. And living in California, I know those aren't natural events. You know, it's a new situation, and so. It creates doubt. These lies that you're talking about create doubt between the cause and effect of 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 the fracking that's going on. And 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 here, I mean, it's such a huge doubt, 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 doubt about climate change. Doubt about prostitution has been there for a long time. And and I think that's what a lot of your work is about. Is is educating that it's not a harmless um, experience it's for women. not a victimless it, it's not a victimless exactly. crime as people so often say At all. it's not right. it's not you know oh it's sex between consenting adults well people consent women consent to horrific oppression all the time 
women stay with abusive men because they don't see alternatives and they don't have the money to escape with their children safely. So um, people agree under duress because they don't have real alternatives. I, I know Amnesty International and other groups are promoting the, the decriminalization of prostitution, and you might want to talk about that. And so who and what's behind this this move to decriminalize prostitution? I know it's a global Well, uh, you know, when people hear the word decriminalize prostitution, they usually think, well, we're talking about decriminalizing the women that are selling sex mm -hmm. acts for money. And that's part of it. But what, and I actually agree with that. Women who are in the position, or men, or transgenders, who, uh, transgendered women who are selling sex should not be arrested ever. They should be completely decriminalized. However, people don't realize that when when the idea of decriminalized prostitution is being promoted, what's being promoted is decriminalized pimping, which right. almost everyone disagrees with. Nobody wants decriminalized, uh, nobody wants a bunch of decriminalized pimps running around saying, well, we're just everyday businessmen, which is what it would be in a decriminalized regime like uh, New Zealand or Netherlands or Germany. Um, pimps would be everyday businessmen. What people are less clear about is decriminalizing men who buy sex, and we've been focusing on that research for about the last seven or eight years, and we've done interviews with these guys in five or six different countries, and it it turns out they have a lot of the same attitudes of entitlement that that are kind of like these extractivist attitudes that you see from the old growth clear cutters, you know. It's kind of like um I'm I have the right to conquer nature, I have the right to conquer women, I have the right to sexual access. I have the right to kill any, you know, you see Trump's sons going over there killing one of the last 2,000 tigers on the planet, you know, and he's he thinks he has the right to do that in the same way that sex buyers think they have the right to buy sex from a woman who usually doesn't have enough money to pay the rent, doesn't have enough food to pay for her kids, or is under some kind of duress, um, doesn't have geographic privilege as somebody in Bangladesh with, or in the Philippines where you see sea level rise. This is the other way that climate change is impacting prostitution, when you have these catastroph catastrophic climate events like floods and droughts uh, and fires and uh, abnormal weather systems, which is what's happening all over the planet, and it affects people's homes, who does it affect first and foremost, the poorest, the most racially and ethnically vulnerable and women and children and old people. Mm -hmm. So those are the people that are most impacted. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people who think, well, prostitution happens someplace like somebody others, somebody else's country like Thailand or, or Nigeria, and they don't realize that right now in the U.S., there are women prostituting for a tank of gas or for a hamburger um, who are in dire economic straits. And certainly one of the things I'd say to your listeners, Jenny, is to get involved 
at a very local level politically so that if you see an attempt to stop yet another uh, support net for those most vulnerable in our culture, like uh, education funding, <clears throat> which every place on the planet keeps women out of prostitution. If women get an education, they're significantly less likely to prostitute. So whenever you see housing subsidies cut, education funding cut, food stamps cut, that, and you want to be an anti-trafficking activist, that's how you do it on a local level. You fight these attempts to offer more money to the 1% out of the mouths of the rest of us. Because when you're talking about prostitution, you're, and you're talking about poverty. Yes, you're talking about yes. poverty combined with sexism, combined mm -hmm. with racism. I mean, I remember when I was in Lusaka, where there was like at the time in in the uh, 90s when I was there in Lusaka, Zambia, there was there was a astronomically high unemployment rate, and um, it was somewhere 80. It was it was so high, I can't even remember the exact number, but it was a very, very high rate of unemployment. And the men were selling pencils or uh, squeegeeing car windshields, right, of, of any vehicle that went by. Um, they were doing that kind of work. The women were prostituting. So everyone was equally poor but you're not seeing equal numbers of men prostituting. This is a uh this is an activity that unequal that is generated by the inequality between men and women. Mm -hmm. And it's prostitution is both generated by sex inequality and it causes more sex inequality because men are taught boys are taught that they have a right to treat women like a piece of meat or as one said to me when I did an interview with him in I I this was in Chicago I asked him how he would explain prostitution in a confidential interview I don't even know his last name how would he explain prostitution to another man and he thought a minute and he said I would explain it this way it's like renting an organ for 10 minutes. Now, when you treat a human being like they're a rented organ, it, it doesn't promote any kind of equality. This is not a form of female empowerment, as some pro-sex trade folks would tell you. It's anything but. It's the opposite for women. And it causes phenomenal harm. We're now seeing that women in prostitution have mental health problems, of course, that are off the chart. Post-traumatic stress disorder at the same level as combat vets or depression, suicide attempts, um, eating disorders, uh, all kinds of mental health problems. And, and the physical health problems, of course, are a little better known by people, although it's not, it's not known by most people that the, the highest rate of homicide against any group of people ever studied is against women in prostitution. They're killed more than anybody else because of this attitude that they are disposable. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's like a tiny nutshell of what we found. And the guys that buy the women in prostitution were were studying theories of male sexual aggression that have been conducted by psychologists over you know thirty forty years. And what we're finding is that 
men who buy sex compared to men who choose not to buy sex are far more, uh, have much more in common with sexually aggressive men. They have less empathy. They, they mistrust and have contempt for women. They think they're entitled to sexual access to women 24-7. They're more likely to commit sexual violence against non-prostituting women. So there's this whole cluster of behaviors that we're learning about. Now, we're hearing more and more about trafficking. I'm sure that you have been dealing with that for your 25 years of working with with this issue. But trafficking, I'm, I'm just, I want to know more about how the women are brought to these fracking sites. Are they, where are they trafficked from? You know, is it, I, I mean, there's so much okay. international trafficking going on. Well, there is a lot of international trafficking, you know, but there's also, it's it's a kind of a simple business proposition. Um, it, and it's, I think, just to demystify the word trafficking, which most people are very confused about, Jenny, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. people sometimes think trafficking involves transportation, and it doesn't. Trafficking refers to third-party control over another person. In other words, a trafficker is a pimp. That's all. They're a thug. Uh, oftentimes they work in small, very small groups, and they kind of offer, you know, to work for bigger organized crime groups because, as we all know, uh, a, a young woman in prostitution can be sold and sold and sold again, unlike drugs or guns, Mm -hmm. which are also trafficked around the world. But drugs and guns, Mm -hmm. you have to manufacture them, whereas Mm -hmm. a human being, you just manipulate them and control them mentally and use them again and again. Most people, this is one of the lies that's put out by the sex trade advocates, who are funded by people like George Soros, who is the main funder of Amnesty International, which is one of the main groups promoting decriminalized prostitution. So as always in politically complex situations, follow the money and you'll understand it better. 84% of adults who are prostituted, are under third-party control. They're trafficked. They're pimped. 84%. A smaller percentage get into prostitution because they have no other alternatives for survival. And a very, very tiny percentage, um, usually those with race or class privilege, are, uh, you know, making the seemingly the choice to do this. But I wanted to tell you, um, I was in, I've been in both uh, Montana and in Oklahoma where there are major resource extraction going on. And in both of these locations, in Montana, in the Bakken oil field, there are pimps from cities like Chicago, like Minneapolis, they're moving women from urban areas into uh, these man camps. Uh, I saw a photograph of a school bus that had been converted into a mobile pole dancing strip club uh, moving advertisement for brothels that was driving through these camps in in North Dakota and Montana. And, 
you know, the pimps are capitalizing on this big time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in Oklahoma, it's an earlier stage of resource extraction. I, as you say, you know, the people that I spoke to in Oklahoma are describing these quote unquote earthquakes. They they are not describing them as earthquakes. They, they say they are more like explosions under mm-hmm. their houses that are terrifying. I mean, certainly earthquakes are very frightening, but the thought of an explosion happening under your house in a mm-hmm. in a region where there have never been earthquakes much before until fracking started is kind of shocking. I. There isn't significant prostitution happening in Oklahoma yet, but what happens over time is people leave the area. No one wants to live there. Jobs dry up. And the people that are left, the women with kids, have fewer and fewer and fewer options. And so it's kind of a different kind of prostitution that happens when you have environmental degradation and disasters. It's the same thing that's happening in northern Africa with droughts that are caused by climate change, generally speaking, um, not local resource extraction effects, but general effects of climate change are causing girls to have to go not two hours for water, but more like four to five hours to get water every day. And they're too exhausted to go to school. Therefore, they're getting less education. Therefore, they're married off earlier. And, of course, the further they have to go, the more at risk they are for sexual assault along the way. So that's, that's kind of how that works. Um, so what I'm understanding about the earthquakes in um, Oklahoma is that earthquakes like you and I experience in California happen at a deeper level in the earth. And the earthquakes that are happening as a result of fracking are very shallow. They're they're more to the earth's crust. And that's why they shake these people's homes so badly. It's It's a different phenomenon than it is what you and I experience as earthquakes. So um, I, think, I think that's I understand it that way too, Jenny. Although I'm not an expert on it, but that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, and I don't know why why it's so hard to <laughs> make the connection. And then when you're talking about well, the it is hard to make the connection. I don't think it's hard. You know, Aaron Brockovich's making the connection. The Pawnee Nation is making the connection. Local people in the Oklahoma City area are making the connection. The people who are obscuring the connection is the oil mm-hmm. industrialists who are making mm-hmm. massive amounts of money from this. You know, mm-hmm. those are the ones who are are hiding it. They're hiding it, literally. And the local politicians that are bought off by the whole Game yeah, like play. Pruitt, who Trump just appointed the head of the <laughs> environment mm-hmm. in the country, comes right out of Oklahoma's fracking oh, my. and oil drilling oh, my. business. It's That was so mm-hmm. depressing when he was appointed. Now, I would hope that you're seeing a, a decrease in prostitution globally over your 25 years of of working with this issue, but with with the refugee crisis around the world increasing i just don't um i don't i don't know if you're seeing a decrease in prostitution um syria the whole refugee crisis coming out of syria the the civil war and all of the horrendous um bombings and all of the result of uh, it all started with desertification. All of the farmers who were growing their food and their rural communities were forced into the cities, and then that's how the government dealt with the influx of the population into the towns. 
and into the into the cities in, in Syria, and we're seeing the results. Um, and now we're all, you know, engaged in this war. So I don't know. Are you seeing an increase or a decrease um, currently in, I, in world affairs? I, I just I don't really know how to answer that. It's hard to say. It's it's really hard to say. I know a lot of people in law enforcement think that with the massive internet advertising of the sex trade on sites, for example, like Backpage, where mm. Um, it's not, I mean, I mean, 90% of the sex trade is online today. It's not people standing in the streets for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's not people in bars or strip clubs. The, the, the contact point is, uh, with a woman who is pimped and being sold any place in the world, it's often through through the internet, through cell phone prostitution. I mean, escort oh. escort prostitution is basically cell phone prostitution. Women are prostituting in many different venues, and um, they have several cell phones usually, and so they're going, they, they answer the cell phone based on what their pimp tells them to do. And women can be rented, so, uh, you know, just like you rent a car. A businessman is going to Las Vegas for a week, and he rents rents a woman along with a car at, at the airport. So I don't know if it's decreasing. Uh, on the other hand, tracking them, tracking these guys is a little easier online because you've got a, you've got a, uh, a trail, an evidence trail online. And some peop some advocacy groups and people in law enforcement are very, very creative <laughs> about busting these guys. It's wonderful. And and there's some wonderful things happening. Like <clears throat> in Seattle there's a um a uh, prosecutor who said, we're just going to enforce the laws against Johns. We're not going to arrest any women, but this city is arresting Johns. You're not welcome here. And, and, and they have succeeded in really making it an unpleasant climate for pimps and sex buyers. And that's so wonderful. That's kind of what the country of Sweden did. Um, they created a very bad business environment for pimps and as a result Sweden has the lowest rate of trafficking in the European Union why because they say to Johns and pimps come here and we're going to put you in jail we're not going to just slap your wrist like they do in the U.S. it's a felony in Sweden it's a serious crime so a lot of us have been very, very inspired by the Swedish law, which was passed in 1999. Mm -hmm. And then that law does one other thing. It doesn't arrest the women who are prostituting or men or trans, trans women who are prostituting. It does arrest the sex buyer. And the government of Sweden provides funding for exit services for anyone who wants to leave prostitution, oh, which wow. is necessary. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really important to do that. Mm -hmm. If you're going to mm -hmm. cut off someone's source of survival, mm -hmm. then you better help them with housing and the other things that they urgently need. Well, that's our social services, like you were saying earlier. We can help on a local level by making sure that those social services are there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean there's some there's some wonderful groups in the US offering these services and everyone that I know of is struggling for funding. So if if people do look up on our website and see this list of resources um for women escaping prostitution and and some of them are serving children, some are t serving trans women. Um, 
consider contributing to them. They need support. If you're, if you like myself, think that research on this is important to change government's policies and laws, then we would love to see some support and you can get to a button on our website or our addresses listed. People can send a check. We're, we're in the process right now of doing a study of sex buyers in Germany. That is men who are buying sex in a legal, uh, setting. And we're, we'll be interested to see if they're different in any way from men who buy sex in an illegal setting illegal. as, uh-huh. yeah, other other countries. Well, the, the Me Too movement is certainly, I think, educating a, a lot of young men differently and young women, yes. I think, differently. That's a, a bright spot on the horizon. It sure is. It sure is. It, I mean, it's holding men accountable, which is the bottom line. They have, they have gotten away with so much sexual violence that, that they're not accountable for. And, and that's, you know, they're, they're losing, uh, public respect and they're losing their uh-huh. jobs. And this is a good thing. This is a good That's a thing. Good thing. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do want to, I do want to recognize our inspiring uh, congressional representative to the U.S., Barbara Lee, who in 2015 introduced a resolution recognizing that climate change disproportionately affects poor women, and as part of the resolution. She noted with her abundance of courage and common sense that you have climate change, poverty, and prostitution all connected. She was mocked and ridiculed in the press. And a couple years later, we're seeing exactly what she's talking about. I, I, I'm reading from your notes, um, from your research papers. It says, in her resolution, Barbara Lee noted that as a result, and she's talking about climate change, as a result of climate change, women were likely to turn to prostitution. Yeah. So your work is so important, Melissa. Um, with climate change upon us and the refugee crisis growing, we haven't stopped fracking yet, although I really think that, that that's a possibility. Um, so you mentioned that we can contribute um, monetarily on your website. Do you use volunteers in your organization? Well, we do. But right now, what we are most in need of is funding to to – um, make this study happen in Germany. The research we do is not uh, quick. It requires training interviewers, collecting data, analyzing data statistically. It's it's expensive, and um, we need about seventy five thousand dollars to finish it. So. We don't, volunteers are not what we need right now. We need, mm-hmm. unless it's volunteer fundraisers, that would be very helpful. Or mm-hmm. volunteer I'll, grant writers who've had experience doing that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And have a passion for your, for the, the subject matter that you're involved in. Yeah. 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 Okay. So as we close here, um, are you hopeful for the future? You're right in the middle of it. So, I, I mean, Jenny, I, I feel as you do that Me Too is cause for tremendous hope, absolutely tremendous hope. And um, we're seeing that movement expand all the time. And so 
I'm a big, what gives me faith more than anything else is grassroots action that shifts from the bottom up. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I I have hope because of me too right now. And, and, and from the bottom the, up is what works. <laughs> yeah, really, I think so. And I think. I think these young people, these young teenagers um, from the last school shooting are showing us that, that it does work Aren't from the bottom they, are up. They're incredible. Yes, As we they are. As we speak, we're just a yeah. few days away from a nationwide march against guns, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. freely available guns in the U.S., um, completely inspired by these teenagers. Uh, mm-hmm. from Parkland and, School. And, and women and rising seeing, around the world. Yeah, we're also seeing the same age young people, teenagers, suing their local governments for for wrecking their future because of a, a lack of action on climate change. Mm-hmm. That's I love that, too. These are like 10- well, and 12-year-olds uh, yeah. in yeah. many parts of the U.S., uh, um, suing governments. And at the United Nations, there's groups, uh, youth groups doing the same kind of thing at that level. So, oh, so that's good to hear. I know. Locally, and, and the United Nations, I think, is, is ahead of a lot of local governments in, in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. in a lot of good ways. Do you have a mailing list and a newsletter that we can subscribe to? That we do. We do. There's work? a contact. If you if you go to our website, at the bottom of it, there's a contact you can write, and we will put you on our mailing list. And Excellent. And we love to be in touch with people. Okay, and we will we'll make some links available to our listeners for 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 the donations and for the newsletter, and also, um, I, I think for that resource page sounds important. So, so thank okay. you. Dr. Melissa Thank Farley. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for the work that you're too. doing and and also for bringing us a more global perspective because we certainly don't get that, you know, in in most of our news coverage um at all. So Thank you for joining us today, Melissa, and for educating us on the connections between fracking and trafficking. Yes. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for inviting me. All righty. And thank you for listening. You can learn more about Dr. Farley's work and PRE at www.prostitutionresearch.com. Please join her newsletter and make contributions to her important work however you can. Thank you for joining us for our free podcast here at Green Woman's Door, where we believe the future is female and full of woman-identified, sustainable solutions. Bye for now.